I call Minister Nadim Zahawi. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. With permission, I would like to uh, uh, make a statement on the COVID-19 vaccine delivery plan. Uh, the plan published today uh, sets out the strategies that underpin the development, manufacture and deployment of our vaccines against COVID-19. It represents, Madam Deputy Speaker, a staging post in our national mission to vaccinate against the coronavirus. There are many miles to go on this journey, Madam Deputy Speaker, but armed with this plan, our direction of travel is clear. And we should be buoyed by the progress uh, we're already making. As of today, Madam Deputy Speaker, in England, 2.33 million vaccinations have been given, with 1.96 million receiving their first dose and 374,613 having already received both doses. We're on track to deliver our commitment of offering a first vaccine to everyone in the most vulnerable groups by the middle of next month. This is a delivery plan for everyone, a plan that will see us vaccinate all adults by the autumn in what is the largest programme of vaccination of its kind in British history. Madam Deputy Speaker, the UK Vaccines Delivery Plan sets out how we can achieve that noble and necessary and urgent goal. The plan rests on four key pillars. Supply, prioritisation, places and people. In April, we established the UK Government's Vaccine Task Force, or VTF for short, and since then they have worked relentlessly to build a wide portfolio of different types of vaccine, signing early deals with the most promising prospects. It's a strategy that has really paid off. As of today, we have secured access to 367 million doses from seven vaccine developers with four different vaccine types, including the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. The VTF has also worked on our homegrown manufacturing capability, including what is referred to as fill and finish process in collaboration with Walkhart in Rexy. Anticipating a potential global shortage early on, we reserve manufacturing capacity to allow for the supply of multiple vaccines to the United Kingdom. The second pillar of our plan is prioritisation. As I set out earlier, essential work to protect those of the greatest clinical risk is already well underway, because the basic principle that sits behind all of this, Madam Deputy Speaker, is to save as many lives as possible, as quickly as possible. In addition, we're working at speed to protect staff in our health and social care system. All four UK Chief Medical Officers agree with the recommendation of the Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation, the JCVI, to prioritise the first doses for as many people on the priority list as possible and administer, administer second doses towards the end of the recommended vaccine dosing schedule of 12 weeks. This step will ensure the protection of the greatest number of at-risk people in the shortest possible time. Madam Deputy Speaker, the third pillar of our plan is places. As of yesterday, across the United Kingdom, we have over 2,700 vaccination sites up and running. There are three types of sites. The first, large vaccination centres that use big venues like football stadia, and you saw many of those launch today. At these, people will be able to get appointments using our national booking service. The second type is our hospital hubs working with NHS Trust across the country. And the third is our local vaccination services, and they are made up of sites led by GPs working in partnership with primary care trusts and, importantly, community pharmacies. By the end of January, everyone 
will be within 10 miles of a vaccination site. A small number of highly rural areas, Madam Deputy Speaker, the vaccination centre will be a mobile unit. It bears repeating, Madam Deputy Speaker, that when it is their turn, we want as many people as possible to take up the offer of a vaccine against COVID-19. The fourth and final pillar is, of course, our people. I'm grateful to the many thousands who've joined this mission. We now have a workforce of some 80,000 people ready to be deployed across the country. This includes, of course, staff currently working within the NHS, but also includes volunteers through the NHS Bring Back Scheme, such as St John's Ambulance, independent nurses and occupational health service providers. And there are similar schemes across the devolved administrations, as well as trained vaccinators, non-clinical support staff such as stewards, first aiders, administrators and logistics support will play their part. Moreover, we're drawing on the expertise of our armed forces, whose operational techniques we heard Brigadier Phil Prosser uh, bring to life at the press conference a few days ago with the Prime Minister. I have every confidence that it will be a national success, and I commend the statement to the House. Philippa Whitford. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. The Joint Committee on Vaccination was very clear that those who live in care homes were the top priority for vaccination against COVID-19. Due to integration of health and social care, Scottish health boards were able to deliver the Pfizer vaccine into care homes in December, and well over 70% of such residents have already been vaccinated across Scotland. In my own health board, the phase is almost complete. So can the, sec the minister explain why in England, care home residents were not the first cohort to receive the Pfizer vaccine in December? And as only a quarter have received their first dose, when does he expect all such residents to have been vaccinated? People over 80 years are now being offered vaccination, but there are only 1,200 sites to cover the whole of England, a similar number to Scotland, which has less than 10% of the population. This means elderly people are being asked to travel long distances, despite their age and the fact that many will be also shielding. As the letter doesn't offer the option to wait and have their vaccine at a local GP surgery, does he recognise that many are now feeling pressurised into travelling despite the current dangers? So will he take this opportunity to clarify that the vaccines will gradually be made available through all GP surgeries and that elderly patients who can't travel long distances will be offered a further opportunity closer to home? He will be well aware of the public concern about the decision to delay the second dose of each vaccine so as to ensure more people receive the first dose more quickly. With the current surge in COVID cases, I totally understand the rationale for this approach. So can he explain why there have been more than 300,000 additional second doses given over the last week despite the JCVI announcement on the 31st of December. Can he guarantee that sufficient quantities of the Pfizer vaccine will be available by the end of February to ensure those given their first dose in early December will receive their booster on time? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. There's a lot there to unpack. Let me try and take it in reverse we can guarantee that those who've had their Pfizer vaccine will get their booster within the prescribed up to 12 weeks. Uh, the uh, question she asks about uh, those who've had a second jab already, the uh, uh, information went out to primary care networks and to hospital hubs uh, that those uh, who have an appointment up to the 4th of January should be able to have their appointment honoured. Beyond that, they've been working very closely with the NHS England team centrally, where we've been supporting them both with resources and actually phoning to postpone those appointments uh, further, hence why we protect many more people. The focus very much now is on 
care homes. We began with the Pfizer vaccine into care homes, and of course, last week on the 4th of January, uh, the AstraZeneca vaccine, much easier to administer, especially for the roving teams into care homes, had to spend two days in hospitals before it was released to primary care networks. But the moment it was, it went into care homes. Now, some areas in England have done uh, their care homes already. Others are beginning to do the same thing. All will be done by the end of the month. Um, she talked about uh, people having to uh, travel long distances, um, but there are 2,700 uh, sites. Uh, no one will be more than 10 miles away from a vaccination site by the end of the month. Marion Fellows. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Before the recent spending review, the SNP had called for an uplift in the NHS in England to bring per capita spending in line with Scotland and thus providing billions to support the rollout of this vaccine and build up capacity. The Treasury announced less than a third of what we had asked for. Does the Minister expect NHS England to be able to keep up with the vaccination demand despite this lack of investment? Thank you, Madam Speaker. Well, the head of NHS England, uh, Simon Stevens, was before the, uh, uh, the uh, Public Affairs Committee uh, uh, today, uh, and uh, I'm sure the Honourable Lady will look at his uh, answers. Uh, suffice to say, the Chancellor has made £6 billion available uh, for uh, the, NHS to, the NHS family to make sure we deliver and deploy as fast as we can to the most vulnerable cohorts in our country. Alan Brown. Madam Deputy Speaker, in Scotland, care home residents have been tackled quicker than in England. Overall coverage in Scotland is similar to England, and pro rata Scotland's got way more vaccination sites. But yet, the Duchy of Lancaster caused concern by stating that the Scottish Government are somehow sitting in supplies, and they did that by comparing coverage to actual allocation. So, as we tackle fake news, does the Minister agree it's irresponsible to politic with fudge figures on such an important subject? Alex Norris. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker, and I'm grateful to the Minister for advice, advance sites of his statement. Now, we meet today at a very challenging moment in handling this pandemic. Uh, we have growing infection rates, we're in lockdown, businesses are shuttered, schools are closed, and tragically, more than 80,000 people have already lost their lives to the, this awful virus. Uh, but a vaccine alone does not make a vaccination programme. And given the government's failures with the test and trace system and on the procurement of PPE, it is right that we scrutinise these plans carefully. Now, the plan itself is quite a conventional plan. Aside from the new big vaccination centres, it uses traditional delivery mechanisms operating within traditional opening times and, and access. As an opposition, we do have some concerns with this. Uh, we believe ex exceptional circumstances call for an exceptional response. 24-7 uh, access. I know earlier today uh, the, at the number 10 briefing that this was, this was said to be something that people wouldn't be interested in. I'm, I was very surprised to hear that. I'd be interested to, to hear from the Minister his basis for that. Now, it's the Government's prerogative to choose their approach, but I'd be keen to hear from the Minister assurance that this plan, as written, as constituted today, will deliver on what's been promised, those top four priority categories covered by the middle of next month. Um, on a recent call, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, the Minister said that the only limiting factor on uh, the immunisation programme would be the speed of supply. Will he publicly reaffirm that and confirm that this plan will make maximum use of the supply as he expects to get it? Now, I think we would all agree that our frontline NHS and social care heroes deserve to be protected. At the beginning of this pandemic, our staff for too long were left without adequate PPE, and we must not repeat this with the vaccine. Protecting them is the right thing to do to reflect the risks that they face, but also it's pragmatically uh, a point of emphasis for us because we need them to be well in order to keep doing the incredible job that they're doing. We're currently missing about 46,000 NHS staff for COVID reasons. The health and social care workforce are category two in this plan, but there does not seem to be national level emphasis on inoculating them immediately, and there seems to be significant variation from trust area to trust area. Will the Minister today commit today to, to meet our demand that they all get their vaccines within the next fortnight? 
very much welcome the, the clear and simple metrics that he's going to publish each day so we can follow the success of the programme. But will he commit as part of that to publicising the daily total of health and care staff vaccinated so we can see the progress made against vi that vital metric too? It was re very much reassuring, Madam Deputy Speaker, to see pharmacy included in this plan. They are at the heart of all of the communities in our country. Uh, they're trusted. They already deliver mass vaccinations. It was disappointing and surprising to see them have to take to the front page of national newspapers last week to get the government's attention. But now with them in the plan, will the Minister reassure the House that he's now fully engaged with their representative bodies and that they are satisfied that they're being used properly? Uh, the number trailed publicly is, is of 200 participating pharmacies. Given that there are 11,500 community pharmacies in England, can that really be right? Uh, are, why aren't there more involved, or is that number wrong? And if so, could the Minister perhaps share with us uh, the, what that number is? Uh, on social care, 23% of elderly care home residents have been vaccinated, and that compares to 40% of the over 80s more generally. Given their top prioritisation, is there a reason for this lag, and what plans are there to close this gap? And is the Minister confident that all care home residents will be vaccinated by the end of the month as promised? And then finally, on misinformation, this is something that's been, uh, I think there's a high level of consensus across this place, certainly between the Minister and I on this, and we will support the Government in whatever ways they think they need to do to tackle misinformation. But we'll have a very real sense of the impacts of misinformation as this programme rolls along, particularly uh, as we look at who's saying, who is and, and isn't declining the vaccine. So I wonder if, if the Minister might uh, tell us what he'll be monitoring there and what the early uh, feedback is, perhaps from our own care staff. Uh, as to who's been saying yes and who's been saying no, what that might mean for the future. Madam Deputy Speaker, we welcome that the Government have published this plan. We'll back them when we think they're right, but we'll continue to offer constructive ways to improve the process, as I hope I've just done, and I hope the Minister can address the points that I've raised. Thank you. I'm grateful uh, uh, for the Honourable Member's um, uh, backing and support, and he asks a number of, of important questions. I'll attempt to answer them. Uh, uh, now for him. Uh, on his 24-hour um, uh, question, so there are, there are two priorities for the NHS, and we've looked really long and hard at this. Uh, priority number one is obviously to target very, very uh, uh, closely those four most vulnerable categories. The priority two is to try and get a vaccination to them as quickly as possible, so throughput. Uh, and this is linked both in terms of, you know, if you go to a 24-hour um, uh, uh, regime, much harder uh, for you to actually just target the vaccine at those four cohorts, because obviously when you have limited vaccine volume, um, if it's 24 hours open, you don't want people standing around or waiting. So the decision to go eight to eight is because we want to make sure there's even spread and targeting very closely. The pharmacies that we are operationalizing, the 200, all of them can do 1,000 plus vaccinations a week. So the focus in phase one, and certainly in the first four categories, and I think for the, uh, the balance, the other, uh, uh, the total nine categories, is very much on targeting and throughput, so that the uh, sites, the 2,700 sites, are the best way that we can target that through, obviously, primary care is very good at identifying uh, those who are most vulnerable or over 80, and, of course, getting into care homes. Hence why uh, the NHS plan and the plan that we've published today it is very much based around those priorities. As we enter phase two, uh, where you begin to want to vaccinate as many adults as quickly as possible, um, in the country, then you want convenience, of course. You want to be able to go into many, many more pharmacies so that you can actually walk to your local pharmacy or your uh, GP and get your jab. These vaccine volumes, now, that will change because with any new manufacturing process, um, especially one where you're dealing with a, quite a complex process, this is a biological compound uh, that you're producing, it tends to be lumpy at the start, but it very quickly stabilises and uh, becomes much more even, and we're beginning uh, uh, to see that, which is actually uh, uh, good news. In terms of health and social care, workforce absolutely committed to making sure that they are uh, vaccinated as quickly as possible. The residents of care homes, we're committed to making sure they are vaccinated by the end of this month.
January, uh, and I, I reaffirm that commitment uh, to him on data. And I'm uh, glad he agrees that it's important because the Prime Minister's absolute uh, uh, instruction uh, to us as a team is we have to make sure we publish as much data as possible, as quickly as possible. Hence why we've moved to a, to a uh, rhythm of daily uh, data and, daily, and then the Thursday more detailed publication um, uh, which will have regional breakdowns that the nation expects and the nation quite rightly wants to see uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, you know, the speed and the targeting that we are delivering. Uh, Stella Creasy. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. As of Friday, the staff in care homes in Walthamstow that serve a smaller community, so those with fewer than 20 beds, tell me that not a single patient has had the vaccine or an invitation to get the vaccine. The minister will be aware that these residents are very aware that they were promised the vaccine originally would come to them by the end of December. They feel like they are sitting ducks. With less than three weeks of January left, will the minister pledge that all of these residents in the smaller care homes will at least get an invitation so they know when they will get the vaccine within the next week? Grateful for the Honourable Lady's question. I um, give her this uh, 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 pledge that we will vaccinate all or offer to vaccinate all residents of care homes um, by the end of the month. Cat Smith. Deputy Speaker, for parts of Lancashire, the closest mass vaccination centre is over 60 miles away in Manchester. The Minister has said that there will be more mass vaccination centres, so can he reassure my constituents that we will get a centre on the Fylde Coast and in North Lancashire? I'm grateful for the Honourable Lady. Uh, she's absolutely right uh, uh, to highlight the issue of distance. No one in her constituency or anywhere else in England will be more than 10 miles away from a vaccination site. Toby Parkins. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. The vaccination centre in Chesterfield, the largest town in Derbyshire, is only opening on Wednesday. It's clear from my recent conversations with Derbyshire Clinical Commissioning Group that we are not currently on target to hit the uh, all groups being, all vulnerable groups being done by the 15th of February, and there is no centre at all in Stavely. So can the Minister tell us what will happen between now and the 15th of February to get from the position we're currently in to achieving the target that he's set that we also desperately want him to achieve? And can he make sure there is a centre in Stavely? Rebecca Long-Bailey. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. In Salford, we receive little or no notice that a delivery of the vaccine from government is due and some batches haven't turned up at all. So when they do arrive, we act quickly. It was therefore staggering when late last night, our CCG was instructed to cancel 924 pre-existing second dose Pfizer appointments with little time to book new appointments before the batch expires at midday on Wednesday. Will the Minister now allow local CCGs to plan and order their own vaccine batches? And can he assure those now elongating their second Pfizer dose that they will be 70 to 90 per cent protected for up to 12 weeks? Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. The, uh, I'll take our questions in reverse. The four uh, Chief Medical Officers have looked at the uh, issue of, of the uh, up to 12 week dosing and all agree that it's the right thing to do. I apologise to people of Salford for uh, that uh, cancellation if that's what happened uh, yesterday. I think we, we've touched upon it, but part of the issue has been the lumpiness in the deliveries in the early days. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I heard the Minister's earlier comments about vaccinations for teachers and school support staff, but can I ask uh, about the position in relation to special schools? Should their staff who work with profoundly disabled young people, including those with serious neuro disabilities and are providing personal and intimate care, not be treated in the same way as frontline social care workers? I'm grateful uh, for the Honourable Lady's question. She's absolutely right to highlight uh, uh, that particular cohort, which uh, some will be picked up in uh, Category 4, uh, some will be picked up in Category 6, including the people who look after them. 
John Speller. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker, and all credit and our great thanks to the Vaccine Task Force and also our scientists who have been brilliant in developing the vaccine, but often in our history it's been production engineering that's let us down. So can we have some figures? How many doses are produced each day and what is our manufacturing capacity? Are there any hold-ups or capacity problems in testing the batches? How many doses are being filled in the vials each day? And again, what is the maximum capacity? Minister. Uh, I'm grateful uh, for the Right Honourable Member's question. Uh, it isn't our capacity, it's the manufacturers. AstraZeneca uh, produced the Oxford uh, vaccine, and of course Pfizer, BioNTech produced uh, uh, their vaccine, and Moderna now is also approved uh, in the process. Uh, in terms of manufacturing, there are a number of processes uh, throughout the manufacturing process. So when you go from uh, the bulk vaccine into fill and finish, there's, there's, there's a period of time, sterility tests that the vaccines have to go through, and then of course batch testing by both the manufacturer and the regulator. All of that gets you know, better and better every single day. It is a new manufacturing process. Both manufacturers, uh, one, AstraZeneca, Oxford are, are delivering 100 million vaccines. That's what we have bought from them. 40 million from Pfizer. We will have millions of vaccines in the next weeks and months to come, and we will meet our target of mid-February delivering the opportunity of a vaccine to the four cohorts that are most vulnerable to COVID. <laughs> Wanira Wilson. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I'd like to just dig in a bit deeper into the supply question. I uh, had the privilege of visiting a GP surgery in my constituency on Friday where I was told by the doctor in charge they can't book the next set of appointments because they don't know when they get the next delivery of vaccine. I've heard from other centres that they're not allowed to move on to the next cohort when they finish their under 80s because of making sure there's equity across the country. And the minister has said we can't have 24-7 vaccination because of supply. So is it the rate at which the product is being manufactured? Is it the rate at which it's being packaged? Is it the uh, rate at which it's being batch tested? Or is it the rate at which it's being distributed around the country that's the supply issue? Minister. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, uh, the Honourable Lady asks an important question. So in any manufacturing, um, uh, and especially a new manufacturing process, uh, it, it is always uh, lumpier at the beginning. There are more challenges. There are a number of um, uh, uh, tests that both the manufacturer and, of course, the regulator. So the batch testing at the end of the process is done by the regulator to make sure that the batches actually meet the very high standards that we have in the United Kingdom. Uh, but, of course, that will begin to become much smoother, stabilise, and we have good, clear line of sight uh, through to end of February, hence why we're confident that we can meet the targets of uh, uh, offering a vaccine to the, to the most vulnerable top four cohorts on the list of nine from the JCVI uh, by middle of February. Uh, I think it's important uh, for her uh, local GPs, one, to obviously thank them, but also uh, to remember that the central team, uh, which is doing the distribution, um, it will get better. The focus of the central team is to try and give as much um, time and notice for primary care networks, for GPs like her own, so they can plan ahead and be able to you know, get those uh, cohorts, the four, four cohorts, in for their appointment. Well, we go to the Chairman of the Select Committee, Jeremy Hunt. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Can I ask you about the speed of the rollout? Many people want teachers to be jabbed as quickly as possible, but is it the case that all those in groups one to four will need their second jabs before we can make real inroads into other key groups. Will he publish not just the breakdown of numbers vaccinated by region, but by local authority area? Because I think a lot of people would like to know just how many people have been vaccinated in their local area. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. And, uh, I think he raises an important point uh, around the uh, critical workforce uh, for the economy, uh, like teachers. So the Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation looked at all uh, these issues and have come out very clearly uh, on the, in favour of us uh, vaccinating the nine uh, cohorts that are most vulnerable to dying from COVID-19, uh, hence why that is absolutely our focus. Um, 
We are absolutely committed to making sure that people get two doses. So if you've received your Pfizer first dose, you will get your Pfizer second dose within 12 weeks of the first dose. Similarly, if you've had your AstraZeneca first dose, you will get your uh, AstraZeneca second dose within 12 weeks. So those people that we will begin to uh, reach in March, where we have to deliver their second dose, they will absolutely get their second dose. Uh, the, the faster we can begin to protect those nine categories in phase one. But the moment we've done that, uh, then it's absolutely right. We should begin to look at uh, the, you know, categories like teachers, police officers, those who may be exposed uh, 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 in, their, in their workplace to uh, the uh, risks of this virus. Of course, it's worth reminding the Howard that it is two weeks after the first dose and three weeks after the first dose with, uh, with AstraZeneca that you begin to get that protection, not the moment you are jabbed. Bob Stewart. <laughs> Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. I'll be as quick as I can. I wonder who my constituents and I should go to when we inadvertently, the system inadvertently perhaps, doesn't actually give out an appointment which it might have done. Minister. Mark Pritchard. Madam Deputy Speaker, perhaps he could also reassure my constituents who have received a letter from NHS England inviting them to have a vaccination in Birmingham or even Manchester, an hour and 45 minutes away, that if they wait just a few more days, they can choose, if they wish, to have a vaccination very local indeed. I'm grateful for my right honourable friend. He's absolutely right, and I would confirm to the House that anyone receiving a letter where it is uh, inappropriate or unable for them uh, to travel that distance to a uh, national vaccination centre. They don't have to. Uh, they'll be able to vaccinate in their primary care network um, uh, at a time and a place that, that is convenient uh, to them. What facilities is his department putting in place to help answer questions from very worried constituents quickly? Rob Butler. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Residents there are increasingly concerned that they've been left behind, and it's been extraordinarily difficult for Buckinghamshire's MPs and Council to get definite information about where and when vaccines will be available. So can my honourable friend confirm that there will start to be vaccines available in Aylesbury in days rather than weeks? James Davis. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Now, many of my Vale of Clure constituents have raised with me their concerns over the speed of rollout of vaccination in North Wales. So will my, right honourable, fr will my honourable friend confirm the quantity of vaccine delivered to Wales so far, and will he undertake to publish regular updates on the delivery of future batches so it can be clear where bottlenecks in the rollout are occurring? Craig Whitaker. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I just wonder if I could just press him a little bit on communication uh, channels with patients and about the vaccination process. We see GP surgery giving out very little information. And of course, you've already heard about uh, the letters going out for the, for the larger hubs. But people just do not understand what the process is. And I just wonder whether my right honourable friend could work with GP surgeries and others so that the general population understands what process it is they're in. I'm grateful for my honourable friend who always asks very important practical questions. He's absolutely right to say that it has been challenging. And of course I will work with primary care networks, with the whole of the NHS family to make sure we get our communications better. Anthony Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. The local NHS are doing a fantastic job at rolling out the vaccine to priority groups in Burnley and Padiel. But I've had some residents contact me confused about what process they need to follow. So could my right honourable friend just set out whether residents need to contact the National Booking Centre or whether they're better to wait for the GP to contact them? If, my honourable friend, if they receive a letter from the National Booking Centre and it is convenient for them uh, to take up that uh, appointment then to call and to, to make an appointment and get their vaccination done through the National Booking Centre. If it is inconvenient, then absolutely they can wait and the primary care network will contact them and give them an appointment to make sure that they're vaccinated because our absolute pleasure is to make sure that the four categories that are most vulnerable to coronavirus are offered a vaccine by mid-February. Christian Wakeford. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. 
We have seen the incredible speed and efficiency of Israel's vaccination drive, which is on track to vaccinate all over 16s by the end of March. So what discussions has my honourable friend had with his Israeli counterpart on replicating Israel's success, particularly in the areas of digitisation and accessibility? For my honourable friend, um, uh, I commend the Israeli government and the Israeli health service for a, a stellar uh, job in vaccinating uh, the most vulnerable communities, and we have a lot to learn uh, from other countries, uh, including the throughput, the speed at which they manage to vaccinate. It's something that uh, uh, we can all uh, uh, learn from and, and improve our output as well. Jeremy Wright. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. Asking for some reassurance about those whose appointments have been cancelled due to the vaccine unexpectedly not being available. Can he confirm they won't be forgotten about, they won't lose their place in the queue, and they will be reached swiftly. I'm grateful for my right honourable friend as a question. He is absolutely right. Uh, the reassurance I can give him is that anyone who's had their appointment cancelled um, will uh, get that appointment reinstated and will get their vaccine. Our absolute commitment is to make sure that those four cohorts of the most vulnerable uh, have the offer of vaccine by middle of February. Stephen Metcalf. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, vaccinating those in care homes will ensure some of society's most vulnerable are protected against this awful virus. However, there are many who receive care at home. Does my right honourable friend agree that these people should be treated in the same way as care homes, as they have no option but to interact with many different people? I'm grateful for my honourable friend, absolutely right, and it's something that the primary care networks are best suited to make sure they, they actually focus on and deliver that uh, uh, vaccination that will protect those people who are most vulnerable to uh, dying from COVID-19. Jim Shannon. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, could I ask the Minister what system is in place that if someone doesn't turn up for their vaccine, but not one slot or vaccine is go goes to waste, and there's a secondary list immediately available with the, with the staff to substitute. And Northern Ireland over the weekend at the Dundon Hospital, they had some people who didn't turn up, but they were able to call upon the midwife's team to come forward. So what policy is in place to make sure that the vaccine is not lost for use? Thank you. I'm grateful for the member for Strangford. Uh, so uh, it really is important, and this is an important message to send to the whole country, that if you are called up, and you have an appointment for the vaccine, please turn up to the vaccine. You know, this vaccine can protect your life. What the NHS in England uh, have done is to make sure that hospital hubs and primary care networks that have been vaccinating, and now obviously the uh, national vaccination centres, is have, um, how can I describe it, on speed dial, Madam Deputy Speaker, uh, their uh, care home uh, 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 workers uh, and those on the front line um, of this battle against COVID who are in the top four uh, cohorts, the categories from the JCVI, to get them in as quickly as possible so not a single dose is wasted. 